<laughs> Dr. Balakrishnan, always good to have you with us and really good to see you again. I know you're a tad jet lag. Let's, uh, let's continue with our discussion. You've just returned from what appears to be a positive trip from the U.S. You talked about engaging Southeast Asia. What's your assessment of U.S. engagement in Southeast Asia in light of AUKUS and the nuclear submarine technology that is shared with Australia? Well, I would look at this in two, two dimensions. First, there's no question that the US is trying to engage our region. In fact, I think in the last few months, uh, Anthony Blinken has engaged with us both virtually as well as in person three times with all the foreign ministers of Southeast Asia. So I don't, you know, we're not, we're not lacking for attention. The question on AUKUS is actually a different, a completely different uh, dimension. And uh, let me put it to you this way. If you look at AUKUS, what it really shows is that Australia has decided to tack far more closely to its historical staunch ally, the United States. So, you know, you can talk about the specifics of nuclear-powered submarines, or you can talk about their cooperation in cybersecurity, technology, and the rest of it. But really, those are details. The strategic point is that Australia has done its own calculations and decided it needs to tack far more closely with America uh, at a strategic level. And in the case of Singapore, um, you know, we have long-standing good relations with the United States, with Australia, and the UK. So on our part, we don't have any undue anxieties about this. These are three long-standing partners. We understand their strategic interests. We know this is not directed against us. Uh, and we will see how this evolves. And as I said in my remarks earlier, the key point is to make a constructive contribution to regional peace and stability and to complement the regional architecture in an open and inclusive way. So as long as these conditions are met, I think this will be positive. The thing is, many countries were caught by surprise. And the Philippines now has come out to say that it may be rethinking its support for it. I mean, could it, could it be a threat to regional peace? Some suggesting it might spark even a regional arms race. I would not venture into that kind of uh, speculation. As I said, take a step back and understand that at a strategic level, the big game is the US and China. And the United States, in its 260 years of independence, uh, and emerging from the post-Cold War unipolar moment, has never had a peer competitor on this scale and at this level of sophistication and occurring at such a critical moment of both globalization and threats to the global commons. So this is uncharted, unprecedented territory. That's on the bilateral level. Now, if you look within Asia, and you ask yourself, well, who are treaty allies of the United States? The answer, Japan, Korea, Australia. And within Southeast Asia, the two treaty allies actually are the Philippines and Thailand. I would stress that Singapore is not a formal ally of the United States. We are in a, in a unique category called major security cooperation partners. Now, I think every country in Southeast Asia, what is it we want at a strategic level? We want peace and prosperity. For the last five to seven decades, a multilateral rules-based world order based on open economies, free flow of investments and trade, and to a large extent, envision and underwritten by the United States, has been a formula for peace and prosperity in our part of the world. But actually, the biggest beneficiary of this world order, in fact, has been China. So things have come one to a spiraled up 
into a new situation. So uh, it's important to understand, therefore, that as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, we do not want to be forced to choose sides. We do not want to become an arena for proxy contests or even conflict. But depending on the issue, we will take positions according to our own long-term national interest. So mm. a certain amount of, I won't say divergence, but a certain amount of diversity in views is to be expected. I would not, again, be unduly anxious or worried about it. But they are, they are neighbours uh, which are anxious. And frankly, I'm quite surprised that you say that Singapore doesn't consider itself an ally of the US. I've always thought that Singapore is no, a close not. ally of no, the US. Not. You can check. Um, yeah, we have no treaties uh, that we've signed <laughs> with the US. We only have a memorandum uh, on of the understanding. Back, on the back of the AUKUS uh, saga, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, there have been suggestions that perhaps the EU may bid to play a bigger role in, in the Indo-Pacific region. Your thoughts on that? Well, first you should ask why the UK is part of AUKUS. And again, at a strategic level, I would say first, the UK has always been a very close ally of the United States and of Australia. Second, I think it also reflects a post-Brexit UK, and also projecting its interests to this part of the world. And in fact, you know that the UK also has applied to be part of the CPTPP. The EU is also reminding everyone that it has interests in Southeast Asia and indeed in the Pacific Ocean itself. Uh, I think France regularly reminds us that they've got a lot of EEZ in the Pacific. So, you know, it depends on how you want to view this. I think the Pacific is where the action is going to be. And the fact that if this is where the action is going to be, major powers, and including powers of regional blocs like the EU, and the mid-sized powers will all have interests in our part of the world. And the challenge for us is to be realist, to read the situation as it is, and as I said, not to panic, not to overreact, um, but to understand what's going on, why these evolutions in architecture are going on, and then to avoid the pitfalls. And it can be done. And like I said, you know, I mean, I've expressed the hope that the modest vivendi will, will first be established between the US and China, and I'm making the argument for multilateralism and a rules-based system. And I'm making the argument for greater economic interdependence, the continued emphasis on cross-border flows, ideas, capital, investments, and trade. Because I strongly believe that this is a formula for peace and prosperity. But we'll see. I mean, events, events will unfold and we will see. You've expressed hope, and I think everybody hopes that it's not a zero-sum game, at least the two uh, sides, the U.S. and China, will not look at it that way. Are U.S.-China relations getting better or getting worse, do you think? What's your assessment at this stage? I think the tensions have escalated. I think the rhetoric has sharpened. But, you know, both at the very top, President Xi, President Joe Biden, these are experienced, seasoned statesmen. Uh, I do not believe that they are aiming for a conflict. But there are certainly issues that they will have to work through, and we do need you know, to give them some space and time to do so. And what we are saying from, from the point of view of Southeast Asia, and in fact from the Pacific, is to say, look, you know, in fact, Confronted by a digital revolution and an existential threat of climate change and an acute challenge from COVID-19, there's so much more to be gained by working collectively, working together. And, you know, I really believe this does not have to be a zero-sum game. We know that uh, President Biden is reviewing his U.S. policy towards China. What needs rethinking? You, you talked about how, you know, 
there needs to be a realignment, rebalancing, readjusting. What would take? What would it take for both sides to come to some sort of a compromise and work together? Well, you know, th this is where you're asking me to venture into dangerous territory and to give advice. <laughs> uh, Your thoughts. You know, I, I mean, mean yeah, just, a lot is at stake in the world. Know, just, just bear in mind, Singapore is not even a mid-sized city in China or in the United States. All right, but <laughs> obviously we have skin, skin in the game. I guess one point which I would make is for the U.S. to understand that whilst China certainly became part of the multilateral system, and particularly with its ascension to the WTO 20 years ago, and that this has been an avenue for an unprecedented historical achievement of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty. But one caveat I would insert is that the U.S. should not expect China to become more like the U.S. China has a deep historical sense of identity. It's a civilizational state. It has absolutely no intention of becoming more like the U.S., both culturally, politically, and even in its economic manifestations to the fullest sense of it. So that's one, one caution which I would include. From the Chinese perspective, China feels its time has come. It had a century plus of humiliation, primarily because it missed the Industrial Revolution. It's determined not to let that, you know, that episode of history repeat itself. So it does demand to be treated as an equal. It does demand, if need be, for rules, processes, multilateral global institutions to reflect that new balance. And therefore, this is a period of adjustment, recalibration and rebalancing, which the two superpowers will have to come to terms with, but the rest of us too. So as I said, watch this space. Uh, again, understand you know, the, the key forces moving these tectonic plates. And then for the rest of us who are on those fault lines, be very, very careful.